Go ahead and go to Exodus chapter 7. Uh, Exodus chapter 7. Right here at the beginning, I'm going to read to you just one verse out of Exodus 9.16 because we're going to uh, kind of cover uh, bits and pieces throughout Exodus 7 through all the way through 10. So we're going to jump around uh, some, but I want to read to you just one verse out of Exodus 9 that's kind of give us our overarching uh, theme today. Um, so I'm just going to read to you Exodus 9.16. It should be on the screen as well. God tells Pharaoh, but for this purpose I have raised you up to show you my power so that my name be, may be proclaimed in all the earth. I'll read it again, just one verse. But for this purpose I have raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. Well, several, several years ago, um, I used to drive for Uber on the weekends, just on the side to make a little extra money. And I picked up this guy from a local restaurant and we got to talking. Uh, eventually, he asked me the same question that everyone asks in an Uber car. Uh, you probably asked your Uber driver this. Hey, do you do this full time or do you just do this on the side? And so I got really excited because I knew the answer to that question was going to change the trajectory of our conversation from that point going forward. It's my favorite moment anytime I would give someone a ride. And so I said, no, actually, I am a pastor at a local church. And he was really nice about it. He said, oh, man, that's really cool. I love that. And he asked me a couple questions. And then he went on to tell me that he went to church as a kid, but he hadn't been in a really long time. And at one point in the conversation, he said, one thing I could just never wrap my mind around is the story of the plagues in Exodus. And so we talked about that for a little bit, but eventually he got to the point where he said, the whole thing just feels unnecessary, right? That God would be that mean to those people. That was an interesting take that I had never heard before, personally. Um, but as we continued to talk about the plagues and the story in Exodus, it became clear to me that this guy understood the what of the plagues. So he could tell me the details, he could tell me what happened, but what he couldn't clearly tell me is why. Why the plagues? And so I'm walking into this, and I'm going to make that assumption about a lot of people. The plagues is one of the most famous stories in our Bible. The majority of people, uh, believers and non-believers, have at least a mild and superficial understanding of this story. And my bet is that most of them could tell you the what, right? What happened with the plagues? But if you ask them, but why? Why did God unleash the ten plagues on Egypt, my guess is those, that those answers would be different. Two of the most popular answers to that question would be, well, some might say, uh, well, he did it to set the slaves free, which is true. Some might say, well, he did it to uh, express his judgment on Egypt. Could be true, right? But I would say that those things are just scratching the surface. There is something much bigger happening in Exodus 7 through 10, and we've already talked about this, but if God's purpose was to uh, just set the people free or to just judge Egypt, then he could have done that all the way back in chapter five. Like God does not need Moses' help to set his people free. He can do that by himself. And God does not need to let Pharaoh know that he is going to judge them. Like, do you ever warn an ant before you crush it with your shoe? Hey, buddy, I I'm gonna stomp on you now. And then you crush him. Like, you don't do that. You're a human being, that's an ant. So, what I want to show us is that God has a bigger purpose that he is going to display through the plagues. And so today, my main goal is to make sure that we understand the why behind the plagues. Why did God do it this way? Because if we don't understand the why, then I would argue that we don't understand this story at all. And not understanding the why in the plagues is like walking into a movie at its most climactic point. Right? So consider Lord of the Rings. Imagine you walk into a movie theater. It's, it's the most biggest and emotional moment of the movie. You would go, so why is that tiny man carrying the other tiny man up that mountain? And where are their shoes? Right? You, you would have no clue what was going on in that moment. It would make no sense to you. Sam carrying Frodo up that mountain doesn't carry any weight unless you understand the why behind it. When I was at uh, Mary Harn Baylor as a student, uh, I was a freshman, and they did this thing, um, especially during Welcome Week, they did this thing where if you're eating lunch in the cafeteria at Hardy Hall, if someone stands on their chair and begins to sing the school song, then everyone has to get up and sing the school 
songs, and I hated it. Oh, it drove me crazy because we had 30 minutes for lunch, and they, this would happen like three or four times throughout the meal, and I'm like, bro, I just want to eat my chicken fried steak, okay? And, 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 and that just, it just bothered me, and it annoyed me, but as I grew in that school, and I became friends with some really um, just solid people, and I began to learn about the traditions, and I got involved into the culture of the campus. My senior year, I was the one yelling at the freshmen, hey, get your C up, brother, okay? Dear Mary Harden Baylor, and I was yelling at the freshmen for them to get up out of their seats because I began to understand the why. Now, we are going to cover several chapters today. So we're going to skip around a little bit because we just don't have time to cover everything. And throughout this text, we are going to stop and ask several why questions throughout Exodus 7 through 10. So let's start with Exodus 7, starting in verse 1. We're going to read all the way to verse 5. It says, And the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my host, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. Okay. So God tells Moses, you and your brother will say to Pharaoh what I tell you uh, to say. He says, tell them to let the people of Israel go. But then God says, but I will harden Pharaoh's heart. So here's our first why question. Why did God harden Pharaoh's heart? And more specifically, even how did he harden Pharaoh's heart? We talked about this a uh, a few weeks ago, but I want to dive a little bit deeper uh, in this moment. In Exodus 4, God promises to harden Pharaoh's heart. And then in our text today, in Exodus 8.15, we are told that he hardened his own heart. Then we are told in Exodus 9.12 that God hardened Pharaoh's heart even more. And then Pharaoh hardens his heart even more in Exodus 9.34. And then God hardens Pharaoh's heart again in Exodus 10. Okay, so we've, in the text, it's clear that from Scripture, we have both going on here. Pharaoh is hardening his heart, while at the same time, God is also hardening his heart. So how are we to understand this, right? Doesn't make any sense. The first thing that we have to understand when approaching this, um, we have to understand from Scripture is that by nature, we all have or have had, if you are saved by grace, a hardened heart. You, me, Pharaoh, your neighbor, your parents, your friend, all of us, as Ephesians 2 says, are by nature children of wrath. The condition of every human being is set on rebelling against God. We are, as Ephesians 2 says, sons of disobedience. And because of that, a just God does have the right to set his judgment on us. And why does this condition and nature exist in all of us? Well, Paul tells us in Romans 5, 12, it'll be on the screen, talking about Adam's sin in Genesis 3. He says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all Sin And so Adam's sin has infected all who are like him, us. As Romans 5.18 says, therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men. Consider the way Paul says it in Ephesians 4.18. He says, talking about those who are not reconciled to Christ, they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to what? Their hardness of heart. And so Paul says that each person without the redemption of Christ is darkened in their understanding. They are alienated from God because of their hardness of heart. So in one sense, Pharaoh's hardness of heart exists because he lives in condemnation because his sinful heart has been inherited through Adam's sin in the garden. And it's the same for us. We all without Christ have a hardened heart and are deserving of God's just judgment. Now, on the other hand, Scripture clearly says that God hardened Pharaoh's heart. And I think in order to understand that, we have to go to another text. Uh, In your Bible, I want you to actually turn there, if you have a physical Bible, I want you to turn to Romans chapter 1. 
Turn to Romans chapter 1. I think we have to look at this text in order to really understand what's happening with Pharaoh here. So we're going to do some exegesis here. Romans 1, 21, it'll also be on the screen, um, if, in case you just have a scripture journal. So he says in verse 21, in Romans 1, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they came futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Verse 24, Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Okay, so let's start in verse 21. For although they knew God. So this isn't referring to the kind of knowledge about God that a born-again believer might have a person whom God has opened up their eyes to see the redeeming grace of God has repented of their sin, surrendered their life to the glory of God. The knowledge here that Romans 1 is talking about is referring to the common grace from God that every person in the world experiences. So while humanity is totally deserving of God's wrath, God's common grace is that he mercifully restrains his wrath and graciously blesses all men. So every person can enjoy the good gifts that God gives us in this world. Things like prosperity, health, happiness, a beautiful sunset, a delicious meal, laughter, right? And God's common grace, God is restraining his wrath, and he gives us these good gifts as a good things as a gift. And in that, we do not fully experience what our nature demands. Does that make sense? What our nature demands, which is the full judgment of God. The doctrine of common grace explains how a person can be totally depraved and yet still, in some sense, do what is good, okay? All hum- so this grace, common grace, falls short of salvific grace. These are two different things. We want to make that clear. All humans still need the saving work of the Spirit through the power of Christ's death and rec- rec- resurrection to reconcile them to God. But here, those that Paul is talking, t- talking about know the common grace of God. But as Paul says, they did not honor him. They're futile in their thinking. And so now look at verse 24. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity. He uses the phrase, God gave them up. He also uses this phrase in verses 26 and 28. He says, for this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, verse 26. And for this reason, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done, verse 28. And so by giving them up, God is essentially removing his common grace from their lives. So the restraint that God places on us, the, the, the restraint that keeps at bay his judgment and also allows every person to experience the good thing of God's creation, those things have been removed. And without common, God's common grace, that voice in every person's head, believer, non-believer, that voice that says, hey, this isn't right, maybe you shouldn't do this. When God's common grace is absent, that voice does not hold back. And when God's common grace is absent, what is the result? Well, the text says they now pursue impurity, verse 24. They pursue dishonorable passions, verse 26. And now they have a debased mind and they do what they should not do. So the best answer I have found for what God is doing with Pharaoh in Exodus is that that is what is happening. God's hardening of Pharaoh's heart is God removing his common grace. He is removing the restraint of his judgment and giving Pharaoh over to his impurity and his dishonorable passions. When God removed the restraint, Pharaoh's own evil heart did what it was already inclined to do. It refused to honor God. Does that make sense? So another question, why would God do that? Why would God do that? Well, Exodus actually tells us, and I read it to you for, for you earlier. Exodus 9, 16, but for this purpose, I have raised you up to show you my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. And so then the question becomes, what is the purpose of God's name being proclaimed in all the earth? This is gonna be one of the overarching things that we're gonna look at today. Why does God care so much about his name being proclaimed in all the earth through Pharaoh 
and the plagues. How does God turning the Nile into blood, sending frogs, gnats, flies, bringing on disease to livestock, boils, hail, locusts, darkness? How does God bringing forth these plagues bring about the proclamation of God's name among the earth? So that's what we're going to look at. So let's start with the first plague, the Nile. Now, again, we're not going to look at every plague. We just don't have time for that, but we're just going to look at the first few. But by the time we get to the third one, you're going to see a pattern and you're going to see what God is doing. So let's look at Exodus um, 7, 17. So why did God turn the Nile into blood? Exodus 7, 17, thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Behold, with the staff that is in my hand, I will strike the water that is in the Nile and it shall turn into blood. So why does God turn the Nile into blood? Well, he says, by this, you shall know that I am what? The Lord. So do you remember back in Exodus 5? It's been a little while now, but back in Exodus 5, when Moses first comes to Pharaoh and he says, hey, the Lord, the God of Israel has told me to tell you, let my people go. Do you remember what Pharaoh said in response to Moses at that point? Exodus 5, 2. Here's what he said. Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord. And moreover, I will not let Israel go. And now here in the very first plague, God says, by this, you shall know that I am the Lord. I told you a few weeks ago uh, that Egypt thought of the Nile as divine. The wealth and power of Egypt was founded on the Nile. Without the Nile, they are nothing. They actively worship the Nile as God. They called the Nile the father of life. Uh, one of the gods that represented the Nile was a god called Happy, H-A-P-I. We'll put a picture of uh, Happy up on the screen. So this is Happy. Um, Happy was the god of the annual flood. So every year the Nile would flood and that flood would make the soil fertile along the Nile River, allowing the Egyptians to grow crops. And now God has just taken away one of their idols. And in its place, he is revealing himself as the true God. It's interesting. Um, you can take that picture down. Uh, something else interesting I want to point out right here with the Nile. This was fascinating to me, so maybe this is just for me than you. Um, but something you begin to see with the Nile, and you'll see it even more as the plagues progress. Through the plagues, we see the deconstruction of what God has created. So the garden in Genesis 1 and 2 was designed to be a place where God's creation would flourish. It was designed to be a place of joy under God's good order. God made darkness and water. It started as chaos, but then God began to put everything in his order. He moved the water and he created land. And then he made grass to grow on that land. He created stars and moons so that we would have seasons. He created day and night so that we would know when to go to bed uh, and when to wake up. He created an ecosystem that works together. Plants serve animals. Plants grow because of the rain. It's complete order in Genesis 1 and 2 by God's good design. But if you'll notice here in Exodus, we see what happens when God takes away the order that he created. First, he turns their source of water into blood, and he makes the source, their source of life uh, and purpose unusable. And instead of good order that is meant to bring life and joy, in his judgment, he shows them what it is like to live without the good order that he created. Let me show you what it's like without work, things working as I have created them. And by the end of the plagues, Egypt has moved back to Genesis 1, to darkness and to chaos. It's fascinating, right? To darkness and to chaos. Without a sovereign God who keeps in order all that he has created, that's all that we have. Darkness and chaos. It's true for creation, but it's also meant to be a reality of what happens to the human soul without the good order of God's purposes in our life. When good order that brings life and joy is forsaken, darkness and chaos prevail. And, and again, this is evidence that God is systematically removing his common grace from not just Pharaoh, but from all of Egypt. All the things that we don't think about, from where we get our water to drink, uh, to the livestock that we eat, to a reality where we aren't sworn with gnats and flies and locusts, like those are common graces from God that we all experience. And God has removed that common grace from life in Egypt. So you begin to see that right here in the first plague. Let's move to the second plague, Exodus 8, 1. 
It says, the Lord said to Moses, go into Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will plague all your country with frogs. The Nile shall swarm with frogs that shall come up into your house, into your bedroom and on your bed, into the houses of your servants and your people, into your ovens. That's crazy. Uh, on your kneading bowls, the frog shall come up on you and on your people and all of your servants. Now, why in the world is God plaguing Egypt with frogs? Look at verse 9 in Exodus 8. Moses said to Pharaoh, Be pleased to command me what I am to plead for you and for your servants and for your people, that the frogs be cut off from you and your houses and be left only in the Nile. And he said, Tomorrow. Moses said, Be it as you say, So that you may know that there, let me read that again. Be as you say, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. The frogs shall go away from your people and your houses and your servants and your people. They shall be left only in the Nile. Did you catch it? So that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. Now, the Egyptians served a God called Heket, H E um, Q E T. I've got another picture of that. You can't really see it that well. But um, if you'll notice, that god, that stone, looks like a frog. So Heket was known as the god of fruitfulness. Could be fruitfulness in childbirth, provisions, legacy. But if you wanted to be unfruitful in some way, you would make a sacrifice to the god Heket. So why is God flooding this land with frogs? Because fruitfulness is only possible through him. And they're worshiping an idol. And that idol is Empty, so that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. Heket is just rock and stone, but my God is living, okay? Next, God sends the gnats, uh, which could be the deconstructing of their God, Geb, G-E-B. Geb was known as a bisexual God uh, who was the God of the earth, right? And if you read the text where God makes the gnats, where do the gnats come from? Exodus 8, 16. Then the Lord said to Moses, say to Aaron, stretch out your staff and strike the dust of the earth so that it may become gnats in all the land of Egypt. So strike the dust of the earth so that it may become gnats. What's God doing? He's revealing who he is to the Egyptians. And in doing so, he is systematically destroying their gods one at a time. Systematically. And then God sends flies, which to me, I don't know, this sounds worse than like hail and darkness, okay? A couple weeks ago, I was putting out uh, one of those fly traps on our back fence at our house, and I, was, I put the powder in, I, I poured the water in, I got some fishing string, and I was going to tie it to the fence, and I dropped it right at my feet, and within 30 seconds, I was, there was flies. I was like, where did you come from? Like, they're just swarming around me, and I thought, man, this is what the Egyptians felt like. You know, uh, I thought this is terrible. I'm sorry. Like, uh, now we don't have time to go through all the other plagues, but this is the pattern that you're going to see in all of them, right? Uh, he's revealing two things here, and keep in mind Pharaoh's question back in Exodus five, where he asked, "Who is the Lord?" So through the plagues, God is one revealing who He is, that He is the true God. These these stones, they are nothing. They are empty. And two, and so He is systematically destroying the worship of these Egyptian gods. And he is revealing that he is the true God by revealing himself as creator. He can turn the Nile into blood. He can make gnats come from the dust, flies swarm the earth, hail fall from the sky. And also he is revealing with every single plague that he is a just and merciful God. And so something else that is interesting, interesting, if you'll notice, with every plague, God gives a warning. He gives a warning with every plague, which tells us something very specific about the judgment of God. That God's judgment is not just a random act that that he does. He he does not execute his judgment without warning, because you'll meet some people today who will say, hey, I can't worship the God of the Bible because he is a cruel God. They'll pull out these moments in the Old Testament and say, well, he's a God of genocide. But it's interesting when you read through the plague specifically, if God was a cruel God, he does a really poor job of it here. He does a really poor job of here because he always tells them beforehand what he's going to do. Like he always gives them a heads up. Pharaoh, I want you to let my people go. If you don't, I'm going to send the frogs. 
Pharaoh says, well, I'm not gonna do it, okay? The frogs are coming tomorrow. Frogs come in, Pharaoh says, I want these frogs out of here. God says, okay, he takes away the frogs. Uh, when God sends the hailstorm, he tells Pharaoh ahead of time, hey, you might wanna get all your livestock inside, uh, all your servants, you might wanna give them the day off because I'm sending a massive storm and if they're outside, they are going to die. If God just wanted to be cruel, then he would have just waited till they were all outside. Okay, now it's time. And there are some that think that God execute, that when God executes his judgment, he is a cruel God. Some people say, man, I can't believe in a God that would send people to hell. And here's what I want you to hear. Um, and you see this theme all throughout scripture. The warnings of God are an act of love. The warnings of God are an act of love. And as a demonstration of his mercy, he has given us, on this side of the cross, his word. Over and over, God has told us, hey, judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. Judgment is coming. Acts 10.42, Peter says, he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to, to be the judge of the living and the dead. We are given warning after warning, just like those in Exodus, warning after warning that God is coming to judge. And when God does exactly what he has warned us that he is going to do, we want to point the finger at him and say, you're cruel. But we have to understand that he hates the evil that dwells within us. And if we are not covered by Christ's blood, then we will be judged because he is a just God. And so if I could plead with you, if you have not repented of your Sin, and when I say repented, I don't mean the kind of repentance that we see in Pharaoh through Exodus 7 and 10. We didn't read through it, but, but throughout the plagues, you see Pharaoh have this worldly sorrow, and it completely lacks the kind of godly grief that Corinthians talked about. So 2 Corinthians 7, 10, for godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. There are these moments in Exodus 7 through 10 where Pharaoh appears to be repentant. But in reality, this is Pharaoh attempting to placate God. Like kids in the room, your parents ever say to you, are you upset that you got caught? Or are you upset at what you did? Any parents in here ever ask that? Yeah. And in Pharaoh's case, he's upset that things aren't going well for him. Pharaoh wants to do what's right only when it benefits him. But no, at no point does he fully surrender to God, and we do the same thing. We want to give God part of our lives, but we want to hold on to these other parts, and that right there is evidence that there are these remnants of a hardened heart. So again, if I could plead with you, worldly grief is an attempt to earn God's favor through our actions. Godly grief is a result of the work of God. And so today, if you walk out of here and you say to yourself, okay, awesome service, I'm pumped up, I'm gonna change my life today. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a better husband, I'm gonna be a better friend, I'm gonna be a better parent, I'm, gonna, I'm not gonna do this, and I'm gonna do more of this, and I'm not gonna do this, and I'm gonna do more of this. If you say that, I'm just gonna be honest, you've already missed the point. You've already missed the point. You can't do anything through your own power. What you need is the transforming power of God in your life. The better place to start would be to acknowledge that you have a hardened heart and ask God to completely transform you, that the power that raised Christ from the dead could absolutely transform your heart. And the encouraging thing I love about this is that if you are asking that question, God, I want a different heart. I want to be transformed. God, change my hardened heart. Then that is evidence that God is already at work within you. That you just wouldn't have a desire to change your behavior, but that you would have a desire to have a transformed life through the power of Christ in the spirit, like the fact that you would ask that question is evidence that God is already at work within you. And that's beautiful. All right, let's talk about another why. Why does God care so much? And why does he go through such great lengths? Because this is extreme. <laughs> why does he go through such great lengths to ensure that his name is proclaimed in all of the earth? So Exodus 9, 16, for this purpose, I have raised you up to show my power so that my name may be proclaimed in all the earth. I, I've met people who are uncomfortable with a reality where everything God does is centered on his own glory, okay? Uh, I mean, on one hand, it can sound like God is just obsessed with himself. Over and over, we are told to love him, to glorify him, to worship him. And people might say, well, isn't that a little egotistical? 
for, for God? Like, why is he so desperate for my attention? C.S. Lewis, uh, before he was a Christian, said that he would read the Psalms, and over and over he would read the Psalms, and they would say things like, you know, praise me, and glorify me, sing to me, and he, he would say that God sounds like an old woman seeking compliments. Just to be clear, C.S. Lewis said that. I did not say that. Apparently their culture had something against complaining old women. Uh, I think in our culture you could say, man, God's like a TikTok celebrity, right? Like, look at me, look at me, look at me. So why does God care so much about the proclamation of his own name? I, I would say it this way. If God had vacancies in his own heart that he was trying to fill, I think then perhaps you could say it was wrong. Like if God needed our praise in order to feel like he was doing a good job as creator, I think you could definitely say that was wrong. But here's the thing about God. God doesn't need our praise and he is fully satisfied in himself. He does not need anything from anyone. He demands it, one, because our praise is rightly his. And two, because in giving him praise, that is where we will find our most joy in our created design. So if, if what God says about himself in the Bible is true, if he really is the source of salvation, the source of life, and the source of joy, if he really is who he says he is, then it's not any kind of pride that drives his desire for his name to be proclaimed and his name to be glorified, but rather the desire for his name to be proclaimed in all the earth is actually an act of love. So let me give you an analogy. Let's say that someone in this room just passed out. Like they went unconscious in their seat. We had to stop the service because we, we've got to get them some uh, attention, just slumped over in their chair. Now, what would happen in that moment? Well, praise God that in this room we have several medical professionals. We've got uh, Kyle Smith and Danny Flores, uh, Jillian Blair, uh, Susan Dornbush. I mean, I'm, I'm probably missing several, right? We've got several medical professionals in here. So um, let's just say Kyle, I'll just first group people, Kyle, Susan, and Jillian, right? Let's say they all start running in, right? And, and they go over to that person and they try to help them. Now, would it be weird if I said, can you believe those three? Like, what are they doing? Like, they're yelling at me, like, get out of the way? Like, who do they think they are? Would that be weird? Yes. Yeah, I can't help that person. I, I don't have the tools uh, to do that. You would say they are exactly who you think they are. And, and because they are who they think they are, they have the right to tell me to get out of the way because I'm not a doctor. I don't have the tools to help someone if they pass out. If they want to know a scripture verse, I'll talk to them right? But, but I can't help them medically. In fact, I would say it would be wrong for someone like Kyle or Danny or Jillian or Susan to demand that we don't get out of their way. Like, they're just sitting in the corner. Well, I guess they didn't want my help. I'll just hang out over here. No, that, that would be wrong. So I would say for God to not demand the proclamation and glory of his own name, I would say that's actually an evil thing for God to do. He's the source of life. He's the only way we, salvation can be found. He better be demanding the, the proclamation of his name because in the midst of our giving glory to God, we find our design purpose. And in that place, that is the only way we're gonna find peace. Consider the story of Rahab, one of my favorite stories in the Bible. She's a Canaanite woman who lived in Jericho. She hides two Israelites uh, in her roof. Some men are trying to, uh, to find them and kill them. And this woman risks everything. Why? Why would she risk her life for some people that she does not know? So Joshua 2, 8, you can turn there or it'll be on the screen. Joshua 2, 8, it says, Before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, and that the fear of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. And here's what she says in verse 10. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who are beyond the Jordan, to Sion and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted. And there was no spirit left in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and in the earth below. Did you catch what she said? For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea. And as soon as our hearts heard it, our hearts melted. For the Lord your God, he is God in the heavens above and on the earth below. And remember what God told Moses. I am doing this for the proclamation of my name in all 
the earth. And here is a girl in Jericho, which is not close to Egypt, in Jericho, who has heard what God has done in Egypt. Now, most of what she says comes from, from what is known as the Song of the Sea or the Song of Moses. It's in Exodus 15. We're actually going to get there in a few weeks, but she's basically quoting it word for word. So she has somehow gotten a hold of this song and she has studied it and she has believed it. And even more incredible, look at what she calls God. She calls him the Lord. She uses the personal name for God. This is a Canaanite. She doesn't call him God, Elohim. She calls him Yahweh, the Lord. The name that God uses, his covenant name, the name that God uses with his people. Somehow, Rahab, we don't know how, we aren't told how, she isn't just operating on rumors. She understands the theology behind what she's saying. She knows why these men are here. She knows why God dried up the Red Sea. She has gotten to know the God who has done these works and it has left her in awe and wonder. We gotta understand this. This woman, by using the personal name for God, she is claiming that he is her God, the covenant name of God. He is in the heavens above and on the earth Below. She is latching her identity to Yahweh. She has forsaken her identity as a Canaanite, and she has called God by his covenant name. The why of the plagues is so that people like Rahab could know the covenant name of God. Now, here's another why that we have to ask from the plagues. Why did God do this to the Egyptians? <laughs> like those poor Egyptians, right? Why did God do this to the Egyptians? I've heard some people say that God is cruel because Pharaoh might have deserved judgment, but the common person in Egypt didn't deserve uh, to suffer through the plague. So uh, I would say that the plagues is actually an act of love, as God is revealing not only who he is to the world and to Pharaoh, but he's actually revealing who he is to all those in Egypt. Um, it's interesting, as you go throughout the plagues, Pharaoh's magicians are always trying to answer God's miracles, right? So God brings a plague, and then the magicians try to duplicate that plague. So like with the Nile, they just build a trench next to the Nile and they get dirty water. It's not clean water from the Nile, but it's, it's water. So by the time they get to the gnats though, they can no longer duplicate God's power. And they say to Pharaoh, hey, <laughs> this is the finger of God. And you essentially see Pharaoh's magicians move away from Pharaoh and essentially say, man, this is something else. We don't understand this. And what the Israelite God is doing for the Egyptians is he's showing them that he is different. There's something bigger and better about him. And then in Exodus 11, three, it says, the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt and the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. So through the plagues, God is displaying who he is to everyone in Egypt and they are taking notice. And you get this, uh, and then when you get to the actual Exodus in Exodus 12, 37, it says, the people of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot, besides women and children. And then look at verse 38. A mixed multitude also went up with them. Very much livestock, both herds uh, and flocks. So it wasn't just the Israelites that left. It wasn't just the Israelites in the Exodus. If this is true, there were multiple ethnicities that left Egypt because God revealed who he was through the plagues. So did he judge the Egyptians? You bet he did. But he also redeemed many of them, right? And when you get to the book of Isaiah, we're told that there will be a day of ultimate, reception, uh, ultimate redemption. In Isaiah 19.9, it says, in that day there will be an altar of the Lord in the midst of the land of where? Egypt. And a pillar to the Lord at its border. He says there will be a day when Egypt will worship the Lord. And then Isaiah 19, 23, it says, in that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria and Assyria will come into Egypt and Egypt into Assyria and the Egyptians will worship with the Assyrians. And that day, Israel will be the third with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth, whom the Lord of hosts has blessed saying, blessed be Egypt, my people, Egypt, my people, Assyria, the work of my hands and Israel, my inheritance. And what's interesting about this if you look at Israel's history, the greatest enemy to the north was Assyria, and their greatest enemy to the south was the Egyptians. And what's beautiful about this is God is saying, there is coming a day when you will all be my people, when you will worship me together. So why did God do this to the Egyptians? Yeah, I think part of it was ju judgment, but I think also part of it was redemption. God is revealing himself to who he is, and he is better than any kind of suffering that they could suffer. 
Last question. Why doesn't God work like this anymore? Okay, so let me ask a different way. Does God still work through things like plagues? Yeah, absolutely. Um, can God still part the Red Sea if he wants to? Yeah, absolutely. But you don't hear God talk today like he does here in Exodus. He doesn't say, hey, Colton, tomorrow I'm going to bring a hailstorm, right? So get your dogs inside, all right, and just prepare uh, for that. He doesn't do that. So then the, the question is, okay, if God's main goal is the proclamation of his name, then how does he do that today? Like, what's his main way of doing that? Well, let me read to you 2 Corinthians 5.20. Paul says, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. One of my wife's favorite quotes, I've heard her say it many times, is that the gospel came to you on its way to someone else. In other words, the gospel's end goal was not you. Did you know that? Like the gospel's end goal it is not you. Like it would make no sense for like the gospel to go from person to, from person to person for century, thousands of years, and then when the gospel gets to you, it just stops. Right? It doesn't make any sense. So the gospel does not stop with you. Um, the gospel came to you not just so that you could hear it, not just so that you could say, "Hey, man, I heard the gospel, and now I go to church." It's not enough to say that. The picture we see in Scripture is that the gospel came to you and now God equips you through the Holy Spirit to proclaim the gospel to someone else. So today, God primarily, primarily displays who he is through his people. The church is not a building. I don't know if you knew that. You don't go to church and go from church. The church is the people of God. And the head of the church, Jesus, is gathering his people to worship him, to love him, to build up and encourage one another, and he's equipping his people with his word and with his love to display who he is to a broken world. And so church, let's let's beg God to give us hearts that desires the things that he desires, that we would see his name proclaimed in all the earth. And let me close by saying this. There will be a lot of times in our life when the what, like the what of the plagues is messy. There will be a lot of times in our life when the what is messy, right? You felt that. You've been through those moments where we describe this messiness of life and the what is just not pretty. But as followers of Jesus, we have to understand that God is building in us a big why. He's building in us a big why, that at the end of all things, God's why for what he does in our lives holds a promise. It's a promise that he will complete the work that he has begun. It's a promise that we will be with him and we will be his people. And then he will take those what's, those messy what's in our lives, those moments of pain when you lose someone that you love, the pain in our marriages, the pain in our relationships, and he will take those what's and he will use those what's to bring himself glory through the proclamation of his name. As Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1.3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God, that God will use even our greatest afflictions to be able to comfort others, to bring about the proclamation of his name. This is who we are at the church. We, came bro- we come broken, we come raw, we come in need, and God fills us, and he reminds us why. Why are we here to worship him? Why are we alive to worship him? Why are we bold in our faith? Because we want to see people worship him. Why do we go to the nations? Because we want to see them know the joy of salvation. There's nothing better than him. And he molds us and he shapes us and he'll do that through those messy what's so that his name can be proclaimed. We become less and he is lifted up. 